Jonah, a very familiar character out of the Bible. From childhood, we talk about Jonah and the whale. But he didn't just end up in a whale's belly. There was a reason for him being there. And it could have been avoided. The Bible says simply, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. And I don't know if we understand what a privilege it is to hear the word of the Lord. I did not say the word of a preacher, the word of a prophet. I did not say the word of a governor or the word of a king or the word of a president of some great country, but the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. It is in mercy that the word of the Lord comes. God's nature is offended and repelled and rebuffed and revolted by sin. Yet he bears with it like a mother bending over an afflicted child. God endures that which is revolting. And the Bible tells us why. Because he is long-suffering to us with not willing that any should perish. So what is the remedy? If God is going to wait, what must be done? The word of the Lord must go out to men and women. There is no other word that can lift us up out of the mire and muck, the predatory pits of selfishness and sin. There is no other word that can offer hope that will last forever and ever and ever. There is no other word that can order our lives and give us victory over our besetments. There is no other word that can make a difference between us and the running common mill people who serve the devil and his ilk. There is no other word with transforming power. Save the word of the Lord. Make no mistake about it, there is power in God's word. Not magic, but power. God gives it that power. God said that his own word is life. God said that his own word is the truth. God said that his own word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts and divides asunder even to the marrow of the bone. God's word is the thing that can help us cut away the burden, the cumbersome burden of the flesh. The psalmist says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? And God knows as I live and move in this city, there is some cleansing that needs to be done. Men's minds are perverted. The other day, we were driving our car. The red light was red. It turned green and we couldn't move. And we wondered, is the car in front broken down? And then we realized what the problem was. A young lady with immodest clothing was passing on the sidewalk and the man driving that car couldn't take his eyes off her in order to move the car. The minds are corrupt. Our minds are filthy and perverse and putrefying within our skull because of the prevailing filth. Somebody asking about movies a while ago, they are ten times worse than they ever were. They do not sell without sex and violence and filth and bad language. Minds that feed on that cannot be pure. Somewhere the Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. How with all or wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? The Bible says, by giving heed thereto, according to the word of God. We ought to find the answers to our questionings in the word of God. We ought to make sure that when a preacher preaches to us, he is preaching the Word of God. We ought to make sure that before we are moved emotionally, we have been moved intellectually. For God's Word is intelligent and it requires thought and decision. What a privilege for the Word of God to come. And it's a privilege to be an instrument through which it passes. For four weeks it has been my privilege to be here. To stand basically in this spot and declare the word of the Lord. I have challenged you to check up on me. 
I've challenged you to write down the texts and make sure God's Word says what we proclaim it to say. I have challenged you to make sure your Bible speaks, and if it does not speak, you're not required to believe. I have challenged you to listen only to the Word of the Lord. The Bible says the Word of the Lord came unto Jonah. And when God's Word comes, it calls for duty. It calls for action. It's not just an emotional glory hallelujah word. It's a word that requires faith in it. And faith has within itself a germ of action. You can't really believe without doing. You can't really believe without expressing it in words and in deeds, would you say, man? The word of the Lord came to Jonah and said, Arise! And I want to stop with that word. Because whenever the word of the Lord comes, it challenges us to get up out of the dumb. To get up out of the doldrums, to get up out of the common and the ordinary, to rise out of the gutter. The word of the Lord always says, arise. If it comes to you in the middle of the night, it is arise. When it comes early in the morning, it is arise. All through the day, God's word says, arise. While others are doing their thing, God wants us to rise above it. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. When I ride through this city, a great city, full of wickedness, I am convinced in New York and in Washington and in Los Angeles and in other places where we are privileged to go, both in this country and abroad, that wickedness is abroad in the land. Iniquity abounds. And the Bible says the love of many will wax cold. The morals of men are going down. At the same time, the Word of God says, Arise! Lift your sight! Rise up above noise and din and confusion of wickedness. There was a great city and God had feelings for that city. So the word of the Lord came to Jonah and said, Arise, go to Nineveh and cry against it. Somebody's got to cry against sin. There's too much coddling of sin. There's too much compromising with sin. There is too much of this business, this lollygagging with sin, this Pollyanna attitude towards sin. Somebody's got to call it by its right name. God said, go down there and cry against it. If they are practicing adultery, you tell them that the Word of God says, thou shalt not commit adultery. If they are down there telling lies, you tell them that the commandments say, thou shalt not bear false witness. You tell them if they are homosexuals down there, that the Word of God calls upon men and women to be natural in their affections and clean in their thinking. There is wickedness in that city. Go down and cry against that wickedness. I believe a preacher is not worth his salt unless he can do that. Oh, he's not going to be the most popular man in town. And the masses will not follow him, but... Somewhere it is written that those who enter the straight gate will be few, comparatively few. The crowd will always go for the broad way. The crowd will always clog the easy way. But those who will make up their minds to follow God's word, no matter what the future holds, those who make up their minds to stand for truth, though the heavens fall, those who make up their minds to do what God says, even though neighbors might laugh at them. Those who make up their minds to do God's will, even though family members are standing in the way, they will be few. God said, don't let that deter you. Don't let it distract you. You go down there and cry, not against human beings, but against the wickedness that is there. And let men and women know what God requires. Go down there and give them a clear choice. Go down there and make my way plain. Go to Nineveh and cry against the wickedness of that city. Somebody's got to lift his voice and do it. Billy Graham's wife said, if Jesus doesn't come soon and put a stop to this filth and sin, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah 
for taking them out so long ago. Ladies and gentlemen, it is so. And the problem is we're becoming accustomed to sin. We are watching it on television. And it, it, it subliminally enters our minds and our consciousness. Some of us don't even realize it's affecting us. I made a point out here one night, and I hope you don't forget it. Someone has said, well, these movies and these things don't bother me. I can sit and watch them for hours. They don't affect me. You are deceiving yourself. Psychologists say everything that enters your soul through the avenues of the five senses affects your life forever. When the Super Bowl was on, great and rich companies paid $250,000 for 30 seconds to advertise. Now, they wouldn't invest that kind of money if they didn't think television got through to the psyches of men and women everywhere. They are betting their money on it. They believe $250,000 worth that if they can get a 30-second commercial, it will sink in. Even though people are going for sandwiches and cold drinks and beers, they believe that if we get this 30 seconds on, it will affect them and make them buy more Coca-Cola. It will make them buy more Goodrich tires. It will make them buy more General Motors automobiles. 30 seconds! And yet we sit there for hours and say, like someone without senses, it doesn't bother me. Oh, yes, it does. God says, go down. The wickedness is great. And cry against those people. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, it's worth noticing. There is a little word there that indicates direction. The Bible says that he got up and wanted to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and he went down to Joppa, found a ship, and went down into the ship. And it wouldn't be long before he would be down in the belly of a whale, and the whale would take him down to the bottom of the sea. Whenever a soul runs from the Word of God, that soul is always headed down. First thing God said was, rise! But when a person sits here night after night and listens to God's word and then offers his strong reasons, makes up his mind, I'm going to do what I want to do, you might not realize it, but you're headed down! Some will say, but I've been doing this for so long. The truth is, you have not heard for so long what you've heard out here. You will never be the same again. And if it is the truth, and God knows it's the truth, If it is the truth, then to run from it and to raise up our own flags and decide we're going to put it off is to send our souls spiraling down. And who knows what level down we will eventually reach. Old Jonah heard the word of the Lord and he understood it. The word said, Arise. If you obey, you're rising. But in disobedience, he went down. Instead of going to Nineveh, which was in the east, he decided to go in the extreme opposite direction. He was headed west to Spain. In order to get there, he got on a ship bound for Tarshish. You know what? When you read a little bit of this, you realize he wasn't through going down. Because Tarshish was known for its underground mines. And this man wanted to lose himself. He wanted to go where nobody could find him. He wanted to run where the other prophets and church members wouldn't know where he was. But let me tell you, we can't run from God. As as Joe Lewis told Billy Kahn so long ago, you can run, but you can't hide. The Bible says, where can I go to get away from his presence? If I go down into the earth, he is there. If I make my bed in the bottom of the sea, he is there. If I ascend up into the heavens, he is there. We cannot escape God, nor can we escape his judgment. And yet here is a man with a mission from God, getting ready to go down into a mine, into the darkness of a mine. Just to keep from doing what God said. How foolish. 
how foolish going to Tarshish in Spain. Now he's on this ship, verse 4 says, The Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. I want you to know you can't run from God. Would you say amen? amen. If God ever lets you go, you're in trouble. Amen. And there are instances where he let them go. He let Judas go. When Judas realized he had betrayed innocent blood, he went back and he began to cry. And that money began to burn holes in his pocket. He took it in his hand. It was so hot he didn't know what to do with it. And he said to the priest, I've done wrong. And they wouldn't even take the money back. So he threw it at their feet and went out and hanged himself. God let him go. The Bible says it would have been better he'd never been born. Back in the Old Testament, there wasn't one named Ephraim. Bible says Ephraim is joined to his idols. Leave him alone. I've borne with him for a long time. He's crossed over the line. His mind is set against me and so perverted he can't turn around even though I continue softly and tenderly calling him home. He's gone too far. Leave him alone. Now was Esau even further back. Bible says one day he decided he wanted to repent in his own time. We have this way of putting God off. Folks say to me, Pastor Brooks, I'm going to do it. Don't worry about me. You're the one who ought to be worried. There's the one of us here who knows he will go home tonight alive. Every day, practically, that I'm in New York, somebody is dead who didn't plan to die. Even little children are dead. And yet we say, I'll do it in my good time. Well, you might live a hundred years. That is not the thing. The problem is, when a man deliberately decides not to do what God says, he is hardening his own heart. And he is searing his own conscience. And one day when you make up your mind, now, Lord, I'm ready. God might have seen that you've gone too far. He might say, leave him alone. There's no hope for him. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, Esau sought repentance carefully, with tears. Carefully. He didn't just whisper a prayer while he was going fishing. The man went to a place he thought he could have sanctuary with God. I can imagine he fell down on his knees and he anguished with the Lord. And he began to weep and to cry. But the Bible says he could not find repentance. He had gone too far. Brooks can't tell you when you've gone too far. I can tell you when you're going. When God speaks and you start running from his word, you're on your way. Only God knows when you cross the line. And that relates to how much truth you have had, how many privileges you have had, how smart you are intellectually. All of those things only God can judge. But the minute you decide, I'm not going to do what God says, even though I know what he says, you've already begun the far journey. You're already on your way. Well, bless the Lord, when Jonah was running to Tarshish, at least up until now, he hadn't gone too far. God decided because he loves sinners so much, I'm going to try to head this hypocrite off, if I can. He still has the power of choice, but I'm going to try to create some circumstances that might bring him to his senses. So God opened his mouth and blew, and the Bible says a great wind fell upon the sea. And immediately the sea was roiled and angry and began to thunder as the billows rolled, and the ship was caught in the crucible. That ship that Jonah was sleeping on was like a pancake tossed on a griddle. That ship was about to break in two. It was loaded down with goods bound for Tarshish. God had created a conflict in the life of a man whom he was trying to save. And if God could reach him, he could save those men on board. The Bible tells me this. I got a testimony. What is your testimony, my brother? It pays to do what God said. I have seen men and women with their lives in a mess. I've seen them with their futures broken and crumbling to pieces. I've seen them destroy themselves. And I come to the conclusion, it does not pay to follow the flesh. It's not worth it to destroy the sanctity of your body and somebody else's. 
It is not worth it to walk with the devil in times like these. We don't know when our moment will come. Old Jonah said, I know what's behind this. Where the Lord told me to go that way, and I'm headed that way. They said, well, how can we straighten this thing out before we all perish? He said, there's only one way. You got to take me up and throw me overboard. You know, if you read this first chapter, those sailors had more religion than he did. Jonah is willing to sacrifice a whole city to do his thing. These men don't even want to throw him overboard in order to save themselves. The Bible said they rode hard, but they couldn't bring the ship to land. Then they became desperate. And those men who had been praying to all these idol gods suddenly lifted their heads toward Jonah's God. And they said, oh God, please don't hold us responsible for innocent blood. We don't know how to judge this fellow. We don't know if he's bad as he said he was. If he turns out to be good, please don't charge us. For we're doing the best we can. Don't let our lives be taken because of him. And having prayed that prayer, they picked old Jonah up and they started toward the edge of the ship. Can you imagine what Jonah was thinking? Waves out there 30 feet high, wind howling, lightning flashing the threat of God's vengeance, the thunder bellowing the tone of God's wrath, and he's about to be thrown out into it. They reached over to the side of the ship. Every man with a heavy heart gave a heave, and old Jonah was free of their grasp. And as he began to float down, God had arranged. With a great fish. We usually call him a whale. I don't know where he was when the storm started. But God told him, I got a mission for you. I want you to find a little ship bobbing along in the middle of the storm. And I want you to go up near to it because I'm going to have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And when old Jonah started down, I imagine head first, that fish opened his mouth. And Jonah, instead of being drowned, felt himself being sucked in. A slick, hot, stinking journey down a fish's throat to the belly. Now, I don't need any scientists arguing, arguing with me. I've heard scientists say that these giant fish have a cavity in their heads where they can store food and then send it to the stomach. Maybe he was in there. How do I know? The Bible says he went into the fish's belly. And if somebody tells me a fish can't swallow a man whole, then I got some news for them. I went out to the airport one day and I saw a Lincoln automobile. Now all of you have seen Lincoln automobiles, but this Lincoln automobile had six doors on each side. And it was as long as a bus. And anybody with any knowledge of automobiles would know this was no ordinary Lincoln. This was a special built Lincoln. So when God got ready to teach Jonah a lesson, this was no ordinary fish. Don't tell me about the size of his mouth and the size of his esophagus. This was a special built fish. As soon as Jonah was in the fish's mouth, God smiled and the clouds balled themselves up and marched out of the sky. The thunder ceased its bellowing and the lightning was gone and the sea became calm. And the men on board said, that man's God is the true God. And the Bible says they offered sacrifices unto his God. They joined the church. Would you say amen? If some of these hypocrites would get out of the church, more people would join. But, 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 but what about Jonah? As soon as that fish closed him in, he took Jonah for a ride. Now, I don't know if you've ever driven or, or, or maybe you've been on a roller coaster. And when you go over the hump and drop, 
It's something in your stomach. You, you ever feel that? Now you can believe Jonah got a plenty of that. Jonah! Passing in the belly of a fish was taken for a ride. The Bible says that he had seaweed wrapped around his head. Inside that fish's belly were bits and pieces of decaying flesh. The gastric juices was consuming them in giant whale metabolism. And all of a sudden, it's burning old Jonah's hide. The acid has gone through his clothing. and He's stinging and itching and burning and the skin is on fire. And he tries to breathe and the air smells like a fish plant. And when he tries to take a big gulp of air, the fish opens his mouth and seawater splashes him in the face. He's in a mess running from the word of the Lord. Bible says that fish sounded, went down to the bottoms of the ocean, the bottoms of the mountains. And when old Jonah was about to get adjusted, that fish needed some air. And he went back up to the surface, up and down, up and down. Jonah couldn't stand up, wasn't tall enough in there. Besides, all of the surface was coated with all kinds of mucus. It was slicker than ice. He was struggling for his equilibrium. There was nothing he could do to make himself comfortable. When you run from the word of the Lord, the Bible says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. You cannot have peace. All of a sudden, Jonah remembered God. I'm not praising Jonah, I'm praising the Lord now. Jonah decided, look at here, I'm a fool for what I've done. This is all my fault. I got myself in here. Besides, I'm supposed to bow every day toward the temple in Jerusalem and pray. The way this fish is whirling around, I don't even know which way is east. Therefore, I don't know if God will hear me or not, but it's all I got. Jonah said he opened his mouth and cried unto the Lord. Out of the belly of the fish he cried. He said, out of hell I cried. I'm glad God didn't like y'all. I don't know if you'd have heard Jonah or not. But God is a merciful God. And with that, whatever comes our way, he's only seeking our best. And the Bible says somewhere... All things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Jonah's word about which way is east. God said, man, pray. It's the Holy Spirit that leads us to prayer. Pray. Stop rationalizing your situation. Pray. Stop trying to make sense according to your own opinion. Pray. Jonah said, when I felt that, and that's the Holy Ghost, I'm glad. I'm glad the Holy Ghost can get to us no matter where we are. It was the Holy Spirit down there with Jonah. And the Holy Spirit impressed him. And Jonah started praying. Now, I don't have to tell you that man learned how to pray if he didn't really already know how. No ordinary prayer. Jonah began to cry unto the Lord. And what can you cry for? You going to make excuses? Oh, no, no, no. Not now. You going to explain to God why you did what you did? No. That isn't on your mind now. This man needs saving. And only God can do that. And Jonah has nothing to offer God but a disobedient heart. He cried for mercy. And he records that God heard me. Yes, Glory, to God. Glory to God. I don't know whether his prayer I began down at the bottom or up on top. But what I know is that prayer was able to penetrate all of that whale flesh. Six to eight inches of blubber. And then that prayer was able, like a missile, to work itself up out of the sea. And it took off toward glory, aided by the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, if you're sin, you've got an advocate with the Father. Come boldly through the throne of grace that you might find help in the time of need. 
That prayer went on past the sun, the moon, and the stars. That prayer went on past the pearly gates where angels keep God. That prayer entered the very throne room of God and lodged in God's mind. Save me. God decided he's learned, and he spoke to that whale. And that whale headed toward shore. My wife and I were riding along the shore of the Mediterranean in Lebanon when all of a sudden Dr. Shawantes, our guide, was racing through town and I saw a little sign. It said, Joni. Joni. I said, Doctor, wait a minute. What does that sign mean? He said, oh yes, I should have told you. This is where Jonah came ashore. <laughs> and they named the village Joni. Well, now let me tell you something. All along the highway, rock-bound sea, water crashing in like thunder, foaming billows retreating. If Jonah had come up over there, he would have been dashed against a stone and smashed to smithering. But when we got to Jonah, that was the only place between where we began and Biblos where we saw a sandy beach. Isn't God good? He wouldn't let that fish turn him loose just anywhere. He told him where to go. And that fish came in as close as he dared. That hypocrite had made him sick. He was nauseated from his tail to his head. He was glad when God said let him go. He opened his mouth and burped. Jonah rolled out with a billow. Vomited out. And when he tried to gain his footing, the water was only about waist deep. And Jonah could make it to shore. He walked up out of that water now. We parked there to look at all this. And I turned my back to the sea. And right across the road were cliffs. Straight up. As high as these walls. And I thought to myself, you reckon Jonah went straight up there? Word of the Lord came to him. He was living in a nice place. He could have gotten in a chariot. And he could have ridden down to Nineveh. Easy. Best time to obey the word of the Lord as soon as you hear it. If Jonah had listened to the word of God when he heard it, he could have gone along the easy way. He could have stopped in inns at night, gotten his meals at a restaurant. If Jonah had made up his mind to do what God said as soon as he heard it, he could have gone down there like we came to New York. But when you run from the word of the Lord, you're just making it hard for yourself. It's always easiest when you first hear it. Would you say amen, church? Amen. And so now Jonah has got to climb high mountains trying to get home. Jonah's got to come up the rough side of the mountain. And they tell me that as soon as you cleared those cliffs, there was nothing between the sea and Nineveh but desert. No shade, no cool streams, no vineyards and fruit trees, no harvest fields. Desert, desert with its scorpions, its snakes, its thorn bush, and its seething hot sun. Now he's got to do God's will at a disadvantage. Jonah didn't let that stop him. The Bible says that when Jonah got out of there, Nineveh was a great city of three days' journey. But Jonah began to enter a day's journey. Yes, sir. Yes. Now, every time I see that, I have to have a little fun with it. Because some believe it was three days from the sea to Nineveh, and Jonah made it in a day. He got in a hurry after that wheel got through with him. Would you say amen out there? Some people are not ready to serve God till they flatter their backs. Not ready to serve God 
until they are almost dead. Jonah took off. One thing now. Do what the word of the Lord says. In all fairness, I have to tell you that the scholars say that's not the meaning. The city of Nineveh was so big that if you took your time and observed it going through, it would take you three days from one side to the other. So Jonah went in about a third of the way, and he began to preach. I have no doubt that he was in earnest now. I have no doubt that the power was with him now. I have no doubt that the Spirit of God was with him now. And the man preached with such power that even the king came out and said, What can we do to stop the destroying hand of God? Jonah said, Repent! Repent and bow down to the one true God. And the people began to line up. They became converted. Even the king dressed in sackcloth and ashes. And he ordered the whole nation to listen to the word of the Lord. And Nineveh was saved. My friends, when the word of the Lord comes, he's not kidding. And he's not going to change. When the word of the Lord comes, it's time to take God seriously. Would you say amen? Amen. Just make sure it's the word of the Lord. And once you're sure, decide that that settles it. My professor in college went to a convention of theologians. They were discussing theology. And they were at a big round table and Dr. Edwards was sitting there. And they would bring up a question and they'd say, now, Dr. Jones, what do you think? And he'd give his opinion. Well, Dr. Smith, what do you think? And when they'd get to Dr. Edwards, they'd say, what do you think? He'd say, well, you know, the Bible says. The Bible says. And they kept doing that, and he began to get on their nerves. Finally, they got around to him again. Dr. Edwards, what do you think? He said, gentlemen, the Bible. He said, wait a minute. We're tired of hearing what the Bible says. I'm asking you, what do you think? He said, gentlemen, my faith in God's Word is so strong, whatever the Bible says is what I think. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes, please. Today we come rejoicing, bringing in God's sheaves. 